Welcome back, everybody, to day four. Um, we have a break for Saturday, Sunday, so hopefully everyone rests up a little bit. But in the meantime, we have two very exciting lectures today. Uh, the first is given by Shoyeda, and it's lecture three in the course with Dan Roberts. Uh, so, so briefly to introduce Sho, he is also a physicist by training. He got his PhD from Stanford in March 2011. <laughs> um, and back then he was studying black hole physics. And then he did his postdoc at MIT and Duke, and he was doing glass physics um, and maybe solved something called the glass problem, but I'm not sure exactly no. what that is. No. <laughs> but you solved some problem. <laughs> some some problem, glass. yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So maybe that's a more conservative <laughs> statement. Great. Right. Um, and, and then after that, he transitioned to doing machine learning theory, and he's been a research scientist at FAIR for quite a while, although I'm not sure exactly what the start date is. That's uh, originally basically how I met Sho. Um, and, you know, I, I've had lots of conversations with him over the last couple of years and invariably, you know, they're very precise and very useful, which is like, you know, the two things that I want from a conversation. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I'm excited to hear what you're going to tell us. And uh, unless I miss something, feel free to take it away. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Um... Uh, for the friendly introduction, I should say, because we are friends for now. Uh, okay, so the lecture three, like it would be uh, the pre on the principle of sparsity. And before diving into the detail of the talk, like let me kind of zoom out and and like review like where we are heading, and uh, re especially re review problem one to three that Dan has stipulated in the first lecture. So. He started the talk basically by like Taylor expanding the free train network output around the initialization. So this is a Taylor expansion. G star is the network output um, uh, after the training. And then like Z on the right-hand side is the uh, initialization and theta star is the model parameter at, after training and theta is the initialization. And so this is the usual Taylor expansion around initialization. Now, then, like he then articulated the three programs uh, that this kind of Taylor expansion manifest. One, problem one, there's too many terms in general. So, like if you have Taylor expansion, then in principle, you have to keep track of every term, and that's a lot to handle. Problem two, in principle, there is a complicated mapping from what you have a control over, which is initialization over model parameters. So, that's something you can set by hand in a code, but from there you have to kind of pass on to the joint distribution between like theta, z, uh, dz, d theta, and so on and so forth. Like you have to keep track of the statistics of every term in the Taylor expansion. So that seems pretty hard. And then problem three, on top of those things, like you have to keep track of the complicated dynamics that you have in a training, on uh, training dynamics, and in principle, theta star, the model, model parameter after training depends on everything, like theta at initialization, network output at initialization, derivative and higher derivative things, and also the algorithm and data. So that seems pretty hard. And what Dan has done is that basically he, well, he said, but if you could truncate the model for some reason or other, then this complicated dynamics is actually tractable. So here you look at the, at the linear model and in that case, you can basically truncate the, everything except these first two terms and then solve the dynamics uh, in closed form. And he went on to say that the, like, okay, you can study the code radical model looking at these three terms basically. And then you can actually solve that model too if you use the perturbation theory, especially if you have some justification for why the second derivative term is small enough, okay? And in particular, he got the solution of Z star in terms of like theta, Z, and DZ, D theta, and so on at initialization. And then in a, quadratic, uh, in a linear dynamics case, he had algorithm independence. In a quadratic, quadratic dynamic case, you, have, you start to have some dependence on algorithm. Okay. So that's what Dan has done. And if you use that uh, information or technique, then you, you can kind of complete the map to the end saying that if you 
So for each instantiation of the model, you can solve the dynamics. So you can now have a map from distribution over the things of initialization to the statistics or distribution over the train network after the training. So that was kind of the main message of Dan's talk. And uh, this is what you should have uh, kind of philosophically taken out from his talk, his lectures. Okay. So what I'm going to do is to solve the other two problems to go from initialization distribution over model parameter, which is kind of microscopic information about the model, and pass on the more microscopic picture, so to speak, and go, uh, study the statistics at initialization. And as Dan said, and I just remind you, this seems pretty impossible in general, but if you focus on a wide and deep neural network, this becomes tractable, okay? And especially um, if you take this wide limit, then like um, many terms drops, like so the many, even though there seems to be infinite number of terms that you have to keep track of, track of, track of in an infinite risk limit, like you have to keep track of only two, and then like in uh, one over n correction, like you get only a few terms, like three. Okay. Okay, so the, this lecture is about like the principle of sparsity. So I'm gonna try to derive the recursion relation that kind of lets you evaluate a pass on from initialization distribution over model parameters to the statistics of things that you care at initialization. And the next lecture would be the principle of criticality. And I will try to solve the recursions that uh, uh, I'm gonna to derive today. Okay. And I, I see like some of you taking notes, but then like I'm gonna post a slide. So, you know, <laughs> don't worry. About it. Uh, but if that helps you to understand things then please go ahead and write it down. Cool. Okay, so the outline of the rest of the talk is uh, following. So I'm gonna try to review or introduce all the things you need for today's lecture about the neural network. And then I will slowly but surely approach the deep uh, neural network, starting from one layer neural network, uh, two layer network, network, and then like the deep neural network in the end. Okay, and please ask questions. And uh, I've tested this talk. And if you don't ask questions, it's gonna be like, 40 to 50 minutes. But if you ask a question, that's going to be one hour to possibly 90 minutes. So, cool. No questions so far? Clear? Okay. Neural network 101. Okay, so uh, neural networks are defined as follows. Well, like uh, speci specifically, the multi layer perceptrons are defined exactly as follows. Okay. So in the first layer, what you do is that you take an input X and then you multiply by weights in the first layer. So this W1 is weights in the first layer, one indicating that it's the first layer thing. And then after multiplication by weights, you add the bias term B1, I, and then that's what you have uh, in the first layer. And then the rest of the network kind of is iteratively defined. So you take this, uh, pre-activation and then act by this activation function function sigma. So each neurons uh, take uh, input incoming signal and then act by this activation function, fires up. And then again, like it's then that would be multiplied by weights and then added by bias. And then that defines the what's called pre-activation in the next layer. So here, this activation function is well the sigma is called activation function and you can take anything any of your favorite activation function from the library and this list of like perception sigmoid tunch and then like recently redu is more fashionable I and mean, recently meaning like 10 for the past 10 years or so um okay cool and then like the whatever most of the thing i would say apply to any activation function you can take and so that's cool. Okay, and while talking about the nomenclature, like these Z, Zs are called pre-activations. And then the, especially like when you talk specifically about the pre-activation in the last layer, the thing that you get at the top of the figure, then it's called network output. 
Okay, so that's the definition of the new uh, multi-layer perceptron that we'll talk about. Okay, finally, uh, I'm putting hats to the object uh, when I'm talking about the initialization, just to make sure that the what kind of object we're like where in time we are evaluating things. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Okay. I'll let you absorb this slide. Okay, cool. So, huh. so speaking of initialization, these biases and weights, so those B and Ws are called model parameters. And at initialization, they're independently and symmetrically distributed with variances given by following equations. So what this means is just that the, so for example, this first equation just means a simple thing. Like you take a biases in the first uh, elf layer, and then like you're just like distributing each of biases independently um, from each other. And then variance of it is given by C, B. So like take a Gaussian distribution with some like uh, uh, variances, C, B, okay. And this, I said symmetrically, like Gaussian distribution is symmetry, symmetric around zero. And then like in practice, you never do like any asymmetric distribution is always symmetric. So that's that parentheses. Cool. And the same thing about the weights, like you take all the weights that connecting the net, uh, neurons in the network and you independently distribute them at, at initialization. And the correlation between the weights and biases will, uh, different model parameters will develop through the training but I won't talk about that today, okay? And in this uh, expression, the CB and CWs are called initialization hyperparameters. It's hyperparameter because to distinguish from model parameters, there's so many parameters in uh, machine learning, so you have to be careful what they are, okay? And one thing to note it, it, is that uh, I'm dividing conventionally here by one over N, uh, this is like a number of neurons coming into the uh, layer L. And this is like what you do in PyTorch, but more, and that's, it's known to work well, uh, at least. And like, but one thing to emphasize is that this also, uh, as for theorists like us, ensures the good wide limit. Like when you try to take a wide limit of the network, then like it, this is, Unless you do this, like you get some divergence or uh, triviality. So it, I'm, and I'm gonna show that by calculation as we go along, okay? But for me, like uh, the practice dictates the theories and then this is what people practice. So um, you should follow what they do and describe what they are doing. Okay, cool. So that's notations. And to describe the rest of the object I'm gonna to talk today, let me make one aside, and this is the only aside I'm gonna make throughout the talk uh, on gradient descent. So let me just remind you, like, so the gradient descent update is given by this equation, theta at t plus one is given by theta t, t is counting the number of iterations. And this is the minus Eta, eta is a global learning rate, and this lambda nu nu is S matrix that uh, Andrea introduced. We're just like using a different notation. And basically this chunk in uh, parentheses is the derivative of loss with respect to model parameters. And I'm just chain, using the chain rule to break it down into loss derivative with respect to the output and the output derivative with respect to the model parameters, okay? And this lambda mu nu in principle lets you like uh, choose how the gradient on a new parameter affects the set of, uh, set of mu uh, par model parameter update. And, and I'm going to specify what I'm going to do with that in the next slide. Okay. And you don't have to follow this slice algebra, like just like uh, see it schematically, but then since I'm like using, I have an advantage of using the part. PowerPoint, I'm just like writing it down. Uh, oh, There's I see one hand. Show. Yeah, you, okay. you do see oh, them, great. Uh, yeah, I do see, <laughs> thank um, you, yeah. Just quick clarification, mm -hmm. are you summing over J and alpha tilde? Like, is this yes. a batch gradient? Yes, or? yes. Okay. So J is the uh, number of output components and then alpha uh, is the training set. 
And okay. if you're doing SGD, that would be a bar within a batch. Okay. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, I like having questions. Okay, so like if you do the pay like so okay now like you have this like change in the model parameter, how does the pre output of the network change? And you can try to do the net tail expansion in this uh, model parameter updates. And like after some rearrangement, this is what you get. If you're smart uh, quick enough, then you can do this in your head. But if not, don't worry, you can just look at the slide later. Um, okay, so this is what you get in the first term. And this is the the thing in the parentheses is called neural transient kernel, which like people talk about these days all the time, at least theorists. And uh, okay, so then this is called neural transient kernel. And I'm gonna, oh, okay. So, and then if you want to connect what I'm saying to the dance talk, dance to lectures, this is basically the kernel that he introduced. And if you take a linear model and then do this expansion, this is exactly what you get. The neural transient kernel is a kernel in his model. Yes. This is going to be the um, the the kernel because uh, in the quadratic model he mm -hmm. had two kernels or two feature functions, right? right? But this is mm -hmm. the non-effective one. This is like the one that's yes. not changing. Really okay. Yes. Great. So uh, yeah. So if you truncate it here, this would be like you know, kernel doesn't involve. It doesn't matter. But uh, you're actually forecasting the next slide. So if you go to the higher order, then this is what you get. Uh, this thing, complicated thing in appearances, and then the loss derivative uh, square. And so, anyway, squ yeah. Uh -huh. I just have a, I think, I think his question was whether it was the time evolving one or not. Right. Or that's right. step evolving one. And yes. so I think the answer is, yeah. Oh, you. Right. Maybe you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. Uh, uh, yeah, so like. I think the answer here, is yes, though, right? Yes, yes. So like if you try and get it, like it doesn't time evolve, but then like if you go to the higher order, it starts to evolve. And that's like one of the points I wanted to make. So this new object, so let me actually handle this new object first. So this is something called the meta kernel in his talk, this new delta alpha one, alpha two. And in, my, in the context of neural network, I'm gonna call differential of NTK because this is the one that drives the change in the NTK. So that's pretty, uh, um, straightforward naming. And now, like as Byron uh, pointed out, NTK now start to evolve if you include this term. And if you try and get it here, then this DNTK wouldn't evolve. Like you can go higher and higher and being pretty unoriginal, like you can just define the next thing to be DDNTK. And you can also go higher, DDDNTK, DDDNTK, and so on and so forth. So this is just a tear expansion. That we know and love. And as we try to compute these things, these objects, like you realize that uh, this first, uh, so NTK correction beyond the linear model, like DNTK and DDNTKs are order one over N, where N is the number of uh, neurons in a hidden layer, so the width of the network. And this higher order terms like plus dot 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 thing is one over N square for the sumus activation function. And uh, it can be dropped out consistently if your interest is to capture the leading order non-trivial effect coming from the finite width of the network. So far, so good. Okay. Since NDK is pretty important, like let me actually uh, take one more slide to, well, decompose what they are. And actually I'm gonna define something that is layer dependent because my my approach would be recursive. So it would be good to have NTK defined for each layer. So here, like you take a pre-activation in L layer, and then you take a derivative respect, respect to whatever parameter, you square them, and then, but then in squaring them, you put this lambda you nu in general. Um, and then just to remind you, if lambda nu nu, nu was Kronecker delta as often done, then that would be just the vanilla gradient descent. Okay, and then if you take this object at the capital L layer, then that would be the NTK that went into the previous slide dynamical equation. And I'm hiding things so that it's the uh, initialization. Okay, 
now let me put more structure into this abstract object lambda mu nu so that I, I'm so this is was again Andreas S matrix, but usually I'm not gonna I'm gonna make it to be diagonal, meaning that uh, every model parameter doesn't affect the uh, other model parameter. And this strength or fancy looking equations just say the very trivial thing. So let me explain. And then this would be clearer once I start to use them later. So the first equation just says that, okay, uh, I'm gonna just rescale the learning rate by this factor lambda B L for the S layer biases. And then like the second equation just says that, okay, with respect relative to that, I'm gonna rescale the learning rate for the weights to be this lambda W divided by N L minus one, which is the number of neurons incoming, well, putting the incoming signal, okay. And as was the case for the initialization hyperparameters or the variance of the initialization distribution for model parameters, it turns out that it's good to divide this weight and learning rate to be by one over n. And to ensure that the, it, it has a good limit, and we'll see that completely as we go along. Okay, cool. Okay, so. I'm gonna make two more pedagogical simplification today. And just because it's gonna be one talk and I'm just like putting like uh, many con, well, okay, I I'm gonna do some simplification. So what first, like I'm gonna look at the single input and drop something called sample indices. And so that the XJ, the input, I'm gonna be looking at only one input XJ and uh, the output would be just uh, on that single input, and I'm gonna just drop all the delta indices, because especially because it's gonna conflict with Kronecker delta, I'm gonna keep seeing later. Okay, the next uh, one more simplification I'm gonna make is that the layer independent hyper. Well, I'm gonna make the hyperparameter to be layer independent, so and drop the layer indices, and like so, this hyperparameter that we had for initialization distribution, I'm gonna make it to be layer independent and then same for the learning rate thing, okay? And you can look at the reference uh, for more general cases. This is not the, the, the limitation of the formalism, it's a limitation of me giving the talk in real time, okay? So, all those notations and conventions and the concept set, like I'm gonna now slowly, but surely go from ground up or the top, bottom to the top of the network. And I'm gonna try to study the distribution of this object that I introduced, the pre-activations, NTK and the DNTK and so on in the first layer first. And then I'm gonna move on to the second layer distribution. And then I'm gonna recursively go up in the ladder to the last layer of the deep network. Okay. So far, so good. No questions. Um, okay. Sorry, okay. I, I, I did have a question. I oh. <laughs> didn't raise my hand in time. Uh -huh. uh, so you said at the beginning that Z hat corresponds to initialization, right? So this right. is that time. Time zero, we're not doing mm -hmm. any um, training at the moment. We're just looking at, given the initialization, what is the mm -hmm. distribution of like right. the network? Right, and then, okay. but then what, if you combine what I'm saying with what Dan has said, then you can now take the statistics. And since the, his expression after the training is expressed in terms of the initialization, initialized distribution, you can now like kind of infer what the distribution is after the training. So that's what Dan has done. Okay, okay, thanks. Cool, give one more hand, hey, I see. Hey, Sean. Hi, um, James. This is maybe not the right uh, time for the question. Oh, I was, okay. I was, yeah, I was curious about uh, when you're doing the wide limit, you know, uh -huh. I, mean, I think you can have like, you know, different sized uh, layers as long as they're all scaling kind of like with some constant factor. But what about certain network configurations like a VAE or something with like, a really small like constraining layer in the middle that's trying to like force like a low dimensional representation or something. Right, so, so 
so so that 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 would be well so as long as every layer every nl like the width of the network stays larger than like depths of the network then it's going to be fine but then like if you shrink too much like say you have like 10 layers but then like it shrinks to like one neurons in the middle then it sort of breaks down does that sound fair yeah and then chain hey hey Hi. Thanks. So I have a question here. So when mm -hmm. you said n to infinity, do you mm -hmm. require that the input, the dimension of the input is still larger or is finite oh. or have some scale with the Great. Yeah, so so actually input and output dimensions are fixed. Because like they are like to be real, like they are like fixed by the task that you're trying to do. And like what I'm sending to infinity, if you do or large, is the number of neurons in a hidden layers only. Okay, thank you. so so in the mm -hmm. normal NTK, we will put the, the factor one over square root of an upside. So what is the difference between this scaling and that scaling in your oh, so, work? So, so, so what I'm doing is the, precisely the usual scaling, like NTK scaling, and just putting them into this learning rate tensor like lambda mu nu. And okay. Like you can kind of like, if you want, like you can rescale things so that the one of and doesn't appear there, but then it's going to appear in the learning rate and so on. But it's more natural to put that into the definition of NTK itself. So okay, that NTK okay, yeah. will be order one. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thanks. Great. Okay, let's move on. For also, sorry. Oh, yeah. So I, I just, <laughs> yes. um, I'm not sure about the standard parameterizations, but I think one of the important things here is that mm -hmm. the interpretation of the difference of training the weights and the biases. Yes. Uh, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, so one smart student asked Dan, <laughs> is that uh, yeah, there was difference between the biases and weights at uh, uh, learning rate, and that's uh, something that the people don't consider in practice well. But I think if you don't do this, then you actually undertrain the biases. Like biases won't move too much as much as it should have. It could have. And this is one important takeaway from the theory. And we tested it, like it's the right scale, like NTK stays finite and then like it's trainable even though like an bias train more uh, if you do this relative scaling between weights and biases. Okay, cool. Thank you for asking questions. Um, okay, one layer network. This would be pretty easy. Uh, it's going to be a child play, but then we'll play like a child for a while because it's kind of uh, educational. Okay, so I'm going to look at the first statistics of pre-activation, which is defined by this equation at the top. And I'm going to try to uh, di analyze the distribution over this G Z1 in the first layer. Then like looking at the distribution is, well, the analyzing the distribution is same as analyzing all the moments. If you know all the moments of the random variable, then you kind of you do know about the distribution. And so you have first moment or the one point correlator, and then two second moment or two point correlator, third moment, fourth moment, and so on and so forth. Uh, in this uh, specific setup that I set up. Um, since I kind of dis I did distribute the biases and weights symmetrically around zero, uh, this first moment and third moment vanishes. So you can now look at the second moment, fourth moment, like all the even moments. And I see like many questions. Well, on the chat, I see like 11 notifications. Like, are, are they fine? It's just me. You can ignore oh. it. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. I will ignore unless you flag. flag. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the second moment first and then I'll move on to the fourth moment in a moment. Okay, the second moment, so like Z square basically, and I'm in this equation, I'm just replanting, uh, plugging in the definition of it. And let me slowly evaluate. So the first thing contribution comes from like B square, so like this B and B. And for that, like you're basically evaluating the expectation of, of B square, and then that's given just by this definition. So that's that first contribution. And sometimes this is called with contractions, especially in the physics language. Uh, 
but uh, this is just a way to evaluate the Gaussian expectation of Gaussian variables. Okay, and you can do the same for the weights. So you can weak contract the weights, uh, meaning that you can just plug in the distribute this definition of the W variance, and that's what you get. And this xj1, xj2 just comes from these things that's much more in this term. And then there's no term from bw because like they are independently distributed and then they are mean zero. So that's that. Cool. And now like you notice that uh, there's chronic delta, which is common to both factors. So you pull them out and then uh, after rearranging, this is what you get. So let me denote this thing in a parent C square bracket to be Z1. So that it's a uh, one is just to denote that it's first layer object. And that's that, that's my definition of Z, not Z. Okay, and now like having done the uh, two point, the second moment calculation, let me move on to the first moment calculation. And this is the whole calculation. And I'm gonna try to uh, give you the flavor of how this proceed. So the first contribution comes from we contract in two, uh, or uh, so there's contribution from the biases to the force. So bias, 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 bias. If you multiply them all, then there's actually three ways to evaluate them. And if you are well acquainted with the Gaussian distribution, you know how this goes. But if not, then like just use the next three steps to be the rule to evaluate the Gaussian expectation of, yeah, things, Gaussian variables. Okay, so this is the first contribution. If you recontract the first and second biases, or the biases in the first and second terms, then this is that you get Cronin Delta I1, I2, and then the third and fourth give you another Cronin Delta. And you can recontract and the CV square comes from the fact that you're doing this two times, twice. And you can recontract in a different combin combinatorial combinations and you can do the first and third and that gives you that term. And then you can do the, that for the first and fourth and second and third and then that gives you that. So this is how you evaluate the Gaussian expectation that Gaussian random variables. Okay, and then you can do the same for like when you have BBWW or WWWW, and that's what you get. Cool. And after, and in the last step, I just realized that, okay, so this is the square, this thing in appearance is, is square of what I have de defined in a previous slide for the two second moment. So I get this more simple looking ex expression. To, to summarize the uh, two previous slides, this is what we have obtained. And note that the uh, first moment is given in terms of the information in a second moment, and then you're basically getting no more information in going to higher order, and then you can go to the sixth moment and eighth moment, and basically everything can be expressed in terms of this Z1. Okay. And this can be nicely summarized as a Gaussian distribution. And you can kind of see that like if you you try to evaluate this Gaussian expectation with the contraction with variance C, then this is exactly what you get. So here, uh, just to remind you, I'm specializing in the single input and I denotes the neural indices. So this is Gaussian expectation, our Gaussian distribution, and uh, it's summed over the I, the neural indices. And since this is, you can, express the sum exponential of sum as a product of exponentials. So you can factor them out. And this, this the last expression is expressed as a product of each individual Gaussian variables. Okay. So since we've done the math, we should extract some physics. So let me kind of summarize what they mean, what this expression means. So first, like this, Factorization to the uh, independent variables, the i's, means that the neurons don't talk to each other at this level. So they are statistically independent. Okay. So that's one lesson in this uh, first layer. And the, the thing we have done is that basically we have 
started with the description of the distribution over B and Ws, and then we marginalized over for machine learning statistician and then integrated out for physicists uh, this bias and weights, and then got the distribution over Z, Z1. So that's what we have done. And you can interpret this distribution in two ways. One is that you can interpret this as distribution over the outputs of one layer network, or you can interpret as this distribution as distribution over preactivation in the first layer of deeper neural network. And this distribution is created by, again, uh, drawing the initialization parameter again and again from seed to seed when you do the PyTorch. OK. Any questions? No question? Cool. No, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you mean by integrated out P1 and P1? Oh, so it means marginalized over. So you, does that make sense? So when you have, when you try to, so it said we use the word integrated out because that's uh, like what you're doing basically doing the integral over B, B and Ws according to the Gaussian distribution. Okay, yeah, thanks. Great. Great, let me move on to the NDK. So uh, this H is NDK in the first layer and then this equation it's just a definition, just copy and pasting and specialize into the first layer. And now like, let me put in the definition or the com uh, diagonal learning rate tensor, lambda mu nu, that I stipulated in the first uh, well, introduction slide. So here, like by saying that the lambda mu nu is diagonal, you get a contribution only when mu and nu are the same. And like first contribution comes from the biases, uh, uh, bj, bj, the same thing. And lambda b in front is saying that the line is stipulating how we should scale the bias learning rate. And similarly for the weights, that you get dwjk, dwjk thing acting on the two different preactivations. And you have this factor in front coming from this definition that I gave. So this is how you use this definition and how this definition operates, sort of. Cool, so this is just plugging the definitions. And now you can uh, use the uh, definition of the preactivation. So zi uh, initialization is given by bi plus w times x. And you can just do the derivative in your head. And for this bias term, you get the Kronecker delta because it's differentiated in this guy. And for the, W thing, you get differentiate, and then you get this guy falling out. Okay, so this is just calculus, or not even that. Um, then you just rearrange thing. Also, you do the sum over J. You get the Kronecker data between I one I two, and then same thing here. You get X K square two, and you pull out the factor of Kronecker data I one I two, and rearrange things, and that's what you get. And in a very similar way to what I have done for the second moment, you can define this to be lambda i1, i2, but then now h instead of g. And then like previously we had cb and cw, now you have lambda b and double, lambda w. Okay, so hopefully this is followable in real time. Um, okay, so we've done the math, so let's take out some physics out of it. And there are two remarks I can make about this and this, and I can say um, this NDK in the first layer is deterministic and frozen. And what do I mean by that? So like deterministic means that it doesn't depend on any particular initialization. Not that this expression doesn't depend on, on any model parameter like B and W. Like what this means that the, when you try to instantiate the model and then evaluate this NDK, then you always get the same number, however you initialize. So that's what I mean by deterministic. And furthermore, since it doesn't depend on the model parameter, even after the training, it doesn't, it cannot evolve because it, tra what training does is it changes the model parameter, but if it thinks it's independent from the model parameter, it cannot evolve. And this leads to the conclusion that since kernel doesn't evolve, there's no representation learning if you try to interpret the, the NDK as the future square. But uh, yeah, okay. 
let me while at it, uh, let me evaluate this thing, d, d and dk. And uh, here's the definition. And this would be easy peasy because the first thing is the second derivative of the first preactivation with respect to model parameter. But then you notice that the first layer preactivation is a linear function of model parameters. So if we try to differentiate twice, then you get zero. So this is zero. And then you can actually for the DDNTK and DDDNTK and so on, like everything just vanish after the NTK. So you kind of see the flavor of this hierarchy. Um, okay, so DNTK, DDNTK vanish in the first layer. And this is kind of leads to the fact that uh, since DNTK vanish, so NTK cannot evolve. And hence, there's no representation learning. And it turns out that this also implies that there's no algorithm dependence because everything will be linear. So, to summarize what has happened in a one layer network, uh, there's Gaussian distribution for the pre activation, NTK is deterministic, and then DNTK, DDNTK, and so on just vanish. And just to take a step back and put this into the context, like in a context of like the solving the whole problem of getting the distribution after the training. Uh, this banishment of NTK and so on implies that it's governed by linear dynamics. And NTK now is deterministic. deterministic so this H is time independent or step independent. So this is pretty easy to solve. And then Dan has solved it. And you get the simple solution like G star is in term, expressed in terms of things in initialization, especially this Z hat and Z hat here, okay? Now, so, the, and now we know about the statistics at initialization for this Z hat and H, which H is deterministic, so it's not even hard because it's not stochastic. And now you have statistics after training. So this is kind of answering Varun's question that uh, once you solve two problems, then you can now get the distribution after training. And the mean is given by this kernel, kernel NTK, NTK inverse on a training set on a label. Okay, and there's variance, I can write it down, but I'm not gonna do that today. Okay, so some two remarks before going to the uh, deeper network. One, like you actually get the same trivial functional form of statistics for infinite with network of any depths. So even if you go to a deeper network, if you take an infinite width limit, you reduce the discussion uh, distribution for preactivations, uh, deterministic and frozen NTK, and the no DNTK and so on. The coefficients of this NTK and so on, like Z1 and H, start to depend on the layer, but then like, the, the functional form itself doesn't depend on the depth. So you're kind of getting rid of the depth aspect of the deep learning. And as I alluded to a bunch of time, uh, there will be no representation learning, no algorithm dependence, and it's a not a good model of deep learning. So to get a more realistic model of deep learning, you have to go deeper and also go deeper at finite width, because going to the infinite width will kill every pen which phenomenology that we want to model. Good. Now to lay a network. So statistics of G are in the second layer. So this is just the definition. And you just put, so in this first equation, I'm just putting in the definition of B and uh, Z, Z2. And you do the weak contraction. So like just evaluating the expectation of B, B, W, W. And that's what you get in the second line. And then you rearrange things. And then this is you, what you get in the third line. And the only non-trivial um, um, manipulation is that you have to now evaluate discussion expectation or expectation in the first layer activation. But like we derived that the first layer activation is the uh, Gaussian distributed in an independent way from neuron to neuron. So actually each term can be evaluated, each term in the sum can be evaluated independently and you get the single variable Gaussian expectation here, where it's, uh, this Gaussian expectation is defined as usual, like f of z, z at z, 
is given by discussion uh, integral. Okay. And then I define now to be this thing in appearances or square bracket to be Z2 because it's a second layer uh, moment. Second layer, second moment. Okay. Cool. And note that this is kind of recursive in that the G things in the second layer is expressed in terms of the Gaussian expectation in the first layer. And more importantly, this scaling of the initialization hype, uh, initialization initialized model parameter was important. This one over n scaling was important because if I had not divided by one over n, then there would be n terms contributing equally. And you get if you, n becomes large, then it's going to dominate this second moment. And it's going to be really wide variance. And if I make it, made it like to be one over n square or something, then like it would have just vanished. It doesn't contribute anything. So it would have been just zero. Okay, So it was the right balance to uh, divide by one over n. Okay. Now that we have done the second moment, like to study the statistics of Z2, we can go to the higher moment to capture the more, to see whether there's more information to be extracted in a post moment. And in the first layer, there wasn't, but then in the second layer, we find there is. So the, the first step is just uh, also the first thing is just to plug in the definition and then you do the weak conjunction as you did in the last uh, first, first layer. And this is what you get. Um, so this should be trivia after you absorb that material. Uh, the non-trivial step here is that the, to evaluate this expectation. And this should be easy because like this, we have evaluated and it just gives you Gaussian uh, expectation of two activation. But now you have this sum over the two neural indices here in the second term. And then you can divide this contribution into two type of contribution. One is coming from the two, uh, when J1 and J2 is not equal to each other, so that. And there's N1 square minus N1 of them and divided by one over N1 square in front. And this comes from the contribution in the two different neurons, which are independently distributed. So you get the Gaussian expectation from J1 neuron and then another Gaussian expectation from J2 neuron. And you have two activation each, so like sigma square and then sigma square. Another contribution is that the when J1 and J2 is equal to each other, so that gives you N1 over N1 over N1 square. And since you're talking about the coincident neuron and all the activation is in that neuron, so you have activation to the force uh, expectation. Okay, so that's the explanation of this last step. And now you can reassemble the terms and note that with this first few terms, this and that and that, with this multiplication is concisely written in terms of G2 in a previous slide, square. And so this is kind of similar to what happened in the first layer, but now you have this extra stuff and note that it's, both of them are divided, uh, preceded by N1 over N1 square, which is just one over N1. And CW square comes from this prefactor and then sigma you have sigma to the force, activation to the force, and then activation to the uh, square, expectation squared, okay? And I can coincide, so to summarize this, like I can actually look at what's called connected four-point function, or the four-point connected correlator, and you basically have this force moment, and then you can kind of subtract away the contribution that came from the second moment. And this is just repackage. Like if you evaluate, this is just definition. And then if you re-evaluate what you had in the previous slide, then this is what you get. V2, where v, V2 is given by this expression, this Gaussian expectation that you can evaluate. And I'll start to evaluate this, this Gaussian expectation for various activation function in the next lecture. And this is sometimes called nearly Gaussian distribution for when N1 is large. And to explain that, like, note that the, in a Gaussian distribution case in the first layer, if you had evaluated this force cumulant or the four point connected correlator, it would vanish. But now, like, you have this one over N1, that small contribution at the force moment level, and that can be concisely, 
so the, it's deviating from the Gaussianity, but uh, only slightly. So that's why it's called near Gaussian. And you can repackage this in terms of like some uh, into product probability distribution. And I'm not going to do that today, but uh, that's what you get. And you get the quartic term in the exponential. Okay, so to summarize, you have second moment and post cumulant or the four point connected correlator, which is one over n suppressed. And if you go higher than the six cumulant or the six point connected correlator, it would be one of n square and so on and so forth. You have very hierarchical structure in terms of for these correlators. Now, so let's extract some physics. So first, like if you take an extreme limit of n one going to infinity, then this is just reduced the Gaussian expectation. All the higher cumulants would vanish and you are just left with the simple information at second moment. And it's specified by one number here, just G. And in general, if you consider the input, it'd be one matrix, which is called Gaussian process kernel or kernel more generally. But now you go to try to up the ante and then try to describe the distribution at level order one over N. Then now you have to, it's specified by two numbers rather than one. And more generally, it's going to be like actually two tensors, one of which has actually four input indices or four sample indices. So it takes like four inputs. And this B would be dependent on like four inputs that you consider. And most importantly, now because of this connected correlation, variables become, this variable become not statistically independent. And then they, these neurons start to inter interact with each other at finite width. So that was the statistics of Z or Z, the second layer pre-activation. Let's look at the uh, NDK in the second layer. Okay, cool. So first step is just plugging in the uh, definition as before. Now you get the two things like one from the first layer derivative and then another with the second layer derivatives. So let me evaluate this thing divide into first piece and second piece and then evaluate uh, separately. So let's look at the first piece and this is the same as before and you don't have to, uh, well, so it's exactly the same. So you can trust me and this is just the re-rendering of what I had done in the first slide or the first layer. And this is what you get. Just plug it in the definition of the pre-activation in the second layer. And then pull out the Gaussian uh, or the Konica delta, and that's what you get. Okay, so that's all there is to this first piece for now. And uh, one thing to uh, emphasize now is that you have some of the N1 things here, the, the activation square. And this one over N1 comes from the scaling of the learning rate for the weights. And to have the same con order contribution between bias and weights terms, you have to have this one over n to have a right uh, or the competing contribution or the same order contribution. Okay. Now let's move on to second piece. So the, this is just uh, copying and pasting the second piece. And now what you do is that you can use a chain rule and you can express the derivative of the second period activation with respect to the first layer model parameter uh, in terms of this. Thing like just plug in the first layer uh, pre activation in the middle. And this is all you, I did in this first step. And the second step is that the, like you notice that this thing in a square bracket is precisely the NTK in the first layer. So, and in which you, we evaluated to be just Konica delta times H and M1, M2 indices here. And now you can do this. Uh, plug in the definition one more time of this like, second layer pre-activation. You differentiate this with respect to the first layer pre-activation. So you get W and derivative of the activation square and get that. And you do the sum, you chronic get the contracts and this is what you get. So putting these two pieces together, this is what you get. Um, this is sometimes NTK for the equation because it's defining the second layer NTK in terms of the thing in the first layer and the second layer weights. Okay. And two important physics to note is that this is now stochastic and defrosted. 
meaning that now like this, it depends on a random variable z1, z1, and that weights w2. So it now start to fluctuate from instantiation to instantiation when you instantiate the model in the PyTorch. So now you get the different numbers each time. And furthermore, since the W and Z1 evolves during the training, um, now NTK does evolve as well. So now it was frozen before, now it's defrosted. Okay, Varun and Nisha. Um, so Varun first. I was, I was curious about, so like, usually when we're training a neural net, we have back propagation and we go from the end of the network and mm -hmm. slowly start to have um, the, derivatives compile using the chain rule yeah. this way we're going forward because yes. of the act because we're doing the instantiation and initialization we're trying to like propagate like the distribution going forward somehow right? yeah, yeah 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 exactly right and that's an important point that we marked like I, I was going to emphasize later like in ten, five minutes uh -huh. but uh um let me emphasize it now so usually when people evaluate the gradient or ndk you kind of think about backward because like back propagation and so on. But when you talk about the statistic, statistics of this object, it's actually better to think about it in a forward way. And you can do that as I express it here. And that's more, um, and then that lets you do the recursive approach. The, the, the thing that I was curious about is like when <laughs> we, when we t transition, like, okay, like we initialize and here's what the distributions look like at every layer. Mm -hmm. And when we want to start doing uh, analyzing like gradient descent on our mm -hmm. neural net, mm -hmm. we again have to later on like back propagate certain. No, uh, like or does that not so, come? No, so, so 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 what happens is that you now you can express the train network in terms of the NTK, like not the gradient. So like you can repackage the solution at, after training in terms of the NTK and pre-activation and everything. So now you know the statistics about NTK. You can plug that in and you never have to evaluate the specific derivatives. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. this, this is great, thanks. Great, great, so Anisha? Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I have a question about mm -hmm. the derivation of the moments of the neuron in second layer. Uh, maybe uh -huh. I misunderstand something, but it seems to me that uh, uh, it's assumed the distribution of the parameters of the second layer the B, the W mm -hmm. are independent of the values of the neurons yes. of the first layer. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes, that's exactly right. So, and then that's, that's um, thank you for pointing that out. So, but then like, you know that the, when you instantiate the model like B and W in the second layer doesn't depend on anything else, like it's independent. So like you can now first integrate that out and then evaluate the uh, expectation with respect to Z1 later. Okay, so uh, that means in the training of neural networks, the assignment of the parameters does not depend on the previous layer. So, so this is the statistics, statistics at initialization. So at initialization, they don't depend, but over the course of training, they do depend on it. But then now as kind of I answered to Varun, like we are expressing after the training statistics in terms of this object at, at initialization. So it kind of circumvent so combine that very intricate dependency between model parameters just by kind of expressing the solution in terms of these statistics at initialization. Oh, okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you for asking the question. And okay, uh, let me finish. Uh, so since you can, okay, so now like you got this forward equation, you can try to evaluate the statistics and I'll just leave that for fun for the weekend. If you call that fun, I mean, I call that fun. Um, you can evaluate the mean of the NDK and this is what you get. And you can also evaluate the variance or, of the NDK, which kind of captures the fluctuation of NDK, the magnitude of fluctuation. And it, you see that it's one over N suppressed. And you can also get the concrete expression for A2 and B2. And you can look at the solution if you like in that uh, specified chapter. Um, but then I recommend you to do it on your own. And also like now, like the NDK start to correlate with the pre-activation. So there's the, the statistical dependency between these two objects. And D2 and DF, and D2 and F can be evaluated concretely. And you can go further and then like try to 
do the evaluation for DNTK, DDNTK, and you get this one over n suppression again. And if you go higher, it's going to be one over n square. And one important thing to know, I mean, I leave that getting the expression for P2 and K2 to, to be your exercise. And then again, solution is there. Um, one important lesson to take out from this is that now DNTK is not zero. So like now it starts to let you do the representation learning. And in principle, like you have, you can solve the dynamics and the Z star can be expressed as Z at initialization and NTK, NTK inverse at initialization, Z minus one for MAC loss. And some dis despicable expression for depending on Y, Z, H hat, DH hat, DDH hat, an algorithm that Dan has worked out for the uh, quadratic model. And if you extend that to cubic model, uh, you can actually do this. Uh, and I'm not gonna put it down. The important lesson here is that the NTK also changed from the initialization to the after training. So that is indicative of the kernel evolving, the feature evolving. So to summarize two layer, uh, two interpretation, you can interpret this distribution as output NTK and so on of the two layer network or preoccupation and mid layer NTK in the second layer of a deep network. And neurons do talk to each other. They're statistically dependent and there's representation learning, algorithm dependent, so that they now start to capture the rich dynamics of real finite risk neural network. And it, I'll take another 10 minutes to describe what the deep neural network do, but I'll be quick. Uh, but uh, okay. to preface that, uh, this is just two layer network, but then like we wanna learn what the deep network is doing, like what is, and to, answer the question like what is being amplified by the depths of the network you have to go deeper and that's the last part of the talk and it's going to be 10 minutes when i practice so hopefully you can bear with me because there were lots of questions okay so you can start with the statistic of things actually in the interest of time let me quickly go through it so you do the weak contraction. So don't uh, try to parse this in a real time, just like schematically parse the equations. So you do the weak contraction, rearrange, and you get this guy. And in, in the last step is the only non-trivial part. You're picking up the leading contribution in one over N, and that's given by discussion expectation. Now, like if I did with the G in the else layer. Okay, so that's that, and leading contribution. So that's, well, you get, actually, I can go through in five minutes. Cool. Okay, so the two recursion, you get the recursion relation for the two point function, two point correlator, or the two second moment. And the L plus one is given in terms of hyperparameters and then Gaussian expectation in the previous layer. And then there's some one over n correction that you can actually compute. And you can do the similar game. I'm not going to do it. And if you can get the four point uh, or the fourth moment or fourth cumulant information. And in L plus one layer, B is given in terms of the thing in the previous layer. Actually, this first contribution is same as before. Like it's just relabeling, same as before that you got in the second layer. It's just relabeling the indices, layer indices by L, well, two and, two and one to be L and L plus one. But the, this con another contribution, there's another contribution from the fact that the, the, now the preactivation in the previous layer are in general non Gaussian or nearly Gaussian distributed. And then you can compute them, and then there's one of n square contribution that you can ignore. And you can actually, again, evaluate NTK mean, uh, you get the following expression. Just to give you a flavor of where this comes from, uh, and then to kind of iterate the point that was solicited by Baron's question, there's NTK forward equation. So here you, this is a definition in L plus one layer in NTK, and you write it down and put it into two pieces. One is the one of a model primary derivative with respect to in a current layer L plus one, and then the rest of it can be factored out by using chain rule, and then like you get the NTK in a previous layer, and then you can plug in the definition and so on, uh, simplify a little bit further, exactly as I did in the previous uh, second layer network. And this is what you get. 
and you can now from this like study the statistics and so on and that result in a mean that recursion for NTK mean given here and you can simulate study the recursion for the NTK fluctuation and DNTK and DDNTK and it's all tractable. The message here is that the, this is this four point and this NTK fluctuation and the NTK, DDNTK are all one over F N effect. But I should emphasize with capital letters that, that this is everything you need to know at this order in one over N about the dynamics of the neural network. It may seem a lot, but then it's finite and it's tractable, which is great. Okay, and I should also emphasize that the one over n is more like an L over n, depth over width ratio. And that's gonna be the theme of the next lecture. So to summarize, like I've covered the principle of sparse people why the neural network, just to put, to put in the context, like Dan has covered the mapping from the statistics at initialization to the statistics, statistics after training. And I've covered the, uh, technique to go from or theoretical machinery to go from microscopic this, uh, information about the model parameter distribution at initialization to the statistics of important things at initialization. And uh, you know, infinite with limit, this distribution truncated, this dot 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 just truncated, and dh was zero. And you can look at only z and h specified by the two point function. Uh, Z, L, and then uh, NDK mean H because it was deterministic. So one number just dictates the distribution over uh, NDK. Now if you back off from infinite, back off infinite width limit and then large, take the large but finite width at one over N level or like all the hidden layers, uh, neurons is greater than the depth. Then now you have this three object, uh, four object, Z, H, H, D, H, D, D, H, and specified by these num more numbers, but then finite of them. And these uh, questions are all recursively uh, evaluatable. And then there's like uh, RG, RG flow interpretation, or like to say more in a folklore way, there's a folklore saying that the, the neural network cost grain the features as you go deeper in the network, and you can start to make it more precise. Uh, using this recursive approach. And the next lecture is about solving these recursions for deep neural network, and then we'll get the, the principle of critical IT. So that's the end of the talk. Okay, thanks, Sho, for very, I think, interesting lecture. I think the material you presented was hard to present with this <laughs> level of clarity because there's so much of it. So I, I appreciate it, and hopefully everybody else does too. Uh, we definitely have some time for questions and it looks mm -hmm. like there's already a question. So mm -hmm. let's field a few questions. So Andrew first, I think. Whoa. <laughs> Your audio is really static, Andrew. So maybe I can go to Sidak now and then like maybe Andrew can try to fix that. So Sidak. Hello, I think you're muted. Hey, uh, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, yes, I can. Uh, uh, these recursions, these equations look really cool. And I'm wondering what further can be extracted out of them. For example, is it possible to get something about the spectrum of the NTK, like let's say the minimum eigenvalue, how does this change over various layers? Uh, so, so we haven't done it yet, but then that'd be cool. Like if you could do that, that's cool. Um, I think in general, like, if you start to look at the specifics of NDK, then it starts to depend on like input data for sure, like the, how this input data are distributed. And if you could map the statistics of like input data distribution to the statistics of eigenvalue of NDK, that would be really nice. And that's something like I wonder whether we can do or not. So please let me know if you can. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a very good question. And I think it's pretty fun to work it out. And next, Andrew, is it, oh, <laughs> uh, oh, Byron. Could you go back to one of the, um, when you were uh, deriving the, uh, I think the NTK for the second layer, uh -huh. 
Um, yeah, uh, you oh, can ask a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh, uh, uh, the second piece or first piece? Can you go to the next slide, actually? The uh -huh. uh, oh, the this one. Yeah. I, so, uh -huh. like, I'm I'm curious about one like one thing that was interesting here that I wanted to ask about was mm -hmm. the second uh, summoned, like the um, the sigma prime terms. Mm -hmm. If I have something like a relu, right? So that's just going to be zero or one of, or if, even mm -hmm. if it if it eventually mm -hmm. if my um, activation function squashes to mm -hmm. zero, mm -hmm. then um, I guess like, well, I'm trying to understand like certain parts of where uh, z is, it's or like z m one like the um, mm -hmm. activation function is mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. your entire um, NTK around that like. I guess like area at those points is going to get squashed to zero. So like there are there uh, in like I'm trying to think of this from like a geometric point of view rather than mm -hmm. just like an algebraic one. If mm -hmm. I is there a certain way that I can like think about how um, and which parts of the domain uh, if if depending on like uh, yeah on which parts of the domain of like the um, dimension of like layer one will the NTK go through versus not go through? So I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if you've like thought about that or is like- Yeah, there... I, I mean, so like as you kind of, I think you answer your question, I, I think, but uh, like this uh, Sigma prime formula would be like on and off switch. So like whenever, and then Z1 is Gaussian distributed with mean zero at initialization. So now like it's uh, half of the time it's gonna be on and half of the time it's off. And so like it goes through the network half of the time, the NTK will go through it half of the time. Okay. So, so the next, I guess like the reason I, I was curious about this is like mm -hmm. the next, the nearly Gaussian uh, mm -hmm. uh, distributions that you talk mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. how is, how is like the, it seems like the activation function is like kind of pushing you in a, in a direction or like a, uh, for like the next layer, like, oh, this is how much it's going to maybe deviate from, uh, from like, Mm -hmm. or something but i'm not yeah. I, i'm not sure i might be getting that confused with the correlators because this is uh, like the ntk right so um, yeah so so actually if you look at the uh, well so this is exactly what i'm going to be covering like one of the things i'm going to be covering next lecture like how the the deviation from gaussian propagates to the network oh, okay and, that's nice. and, and then like this depends on the activation function as you say as it should and like and uh well and then, as I said, like it's going to be actually growing as the depth grows, like as like depth of width. So that's yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Cool. And then Sam. Hey, Shell. Um, I I had a question. So there's this footnote somewhere in the middle or asterisk about like smooth activations. Oh and, yeah. Uh -huh. um, oh, I think I, I remember in the book that like oh. you guys have like a couple of families of activations. Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. propositions mm -hmm. yes. approved for different ones so Great. i'm wondering about that like um do, do you guys have does the same story go through for like relu and stuff like that uh, yeah, is there so, anything interesting there yeah yes so there is one interesting thing and that's actually hidden in the last or not hidden but then it's actually disclosed very explicitly mm -hmm. in the last chapter like chapter infinity where we discuss relu so everything we said about the, uh, the here applied to smooth activation function so it applies to like relu like function like jelu and switch and so on. Well, when you have a kinky uh, activation function like relu and, and leaky relu, what happens is that you start to get the second derivative of activation function, and that gives it direct delta. And actually, like this one over n, actually d n t k will be one over n, but then d d n t k turn out to be one over square root n, which is like what well, actually we found, well, we tested this by empirically. And if you try to keep track of the changing NTK for Lelu specifically, it would be actually scales like one, not one over N, but then one over square root N, which is kind of interesting, but then it kind of makes sense because we are Taylor expanding in updates, right? And then and when you have no anatomy, you start to uh, rat latch onto that discontinuity and that sometimes matter. And it's actually kind of nice if you could Work out, work that out for Lelu, and I think it's it will be exciting if you could. Well, thank you. Yeah. But oh, so I should say, but that the 
everything we say about the infinite width would go through because everything would be one way and, and to some power suppressed uh, and everything goes through for the smooth type of thing. And yeah. Any other questions? We have 30 minutes. Oh, Baru, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, I keep asking questions. No, yeah, um, that's great. The, the last slide ended up talking about uh, yeah. RG flow. I'm, I'm <laughs> not a physicist, so I, I was just uh, like, I was trying to read while you're answering other questions like that part of the chapter. Um, is there, and I couldn't like understand, is there, is this just comes from like some quantum mechanics stuff? So, or so, so, so it's not specifically about the quantum mechanics, but then like to, um, when you try to take, okay, so in physics, you have a bunch of things and then like at the microscopic level, like there are a bunch of things interacting in a complicated way, but you can try to kind of zoom out in a scale that you kind of probe the system. And it turns out that there's a flow of distribution, like so that in the statnet you talk about the distribution of these particles. And now like you kind of cross grain and then look at the distribution at the more macroscopic scale. And it's exactly like what we have done from layer to layer. Like you marginalize over the distribution in the, pre distribution in the previous layer, pass on to the more macroscopic or the later layer distribution. In a similar way in physics, you go from microscopic to macroscopic like that. And there's a flow of distribution that when you do that. And that's, gotcha. yeah, okay. that's the high level explanation of it. But then you know, there's that's, an entire book. Good. Yeah, you, you should read the book by Golden Phil. I love that book. Uh, uh, Jose? Uh, hello. Um, hello. Great talk. Oh, thank you. And um, some question I have is when you are evaluating the, exp the expectation, the Gaussian expectation, in some cases, it's almost impossible to have a cloud form solution for activation yeah. function. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that you are having there is a Taylor expansion and trying to solve it, but there's also mm -hmm. an approximation. Mm -hmm. uh, do yeah. you keep track of the error when you have like, the approximation there and the approximation you have from the previous layer? So, so two re remarks. Like one is that the, in principle, you can evaluate this on a computer, just single Gaussian integral. So if you are, you are it's like a, well, so that's one thing you can do. But then when you try to give some analytical insights into each activation function, actually, so that's one thing I'm gonna do in the next lecture. So for LeLu, you can actually evaluate most things analytically for a linear network, of course. And for Tanj or like some smooth activation function, it turns out that you can, as you go deeper in the network, you can concentrate more on a part near the zero. So you start to make approximation that becomes asymptotically better and better as you go deeper. And that's the technology we'll develop in a, or sort of allude to in the next lecture. But if you want- But like, with it, the approximation, it, do you mean using quadrature? <laughs> because quadrature is very good when it's low dimension, but when you have high dimension, it's really, really bad. Oh no, so, so like what we are approximating here is just single variable Gaussian expectation, right? That's all that goes into the, the recursions and that you can faithfully approximate in a, in a systematic way. And that becomes better and better in a deep network. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so maybe I encourage you all if you have further questions to follow up with show and Dan by whatever modern methods you prefer. Ah, um, oh, can I interject one thing? Yeah. I think on the Slack uh, thread of our lectures, we decided that uh, after my lecture on Monday, since it's the last lecture of the day, we'll probably just extend and have a TA session that they can ask questions to Dan or me. Oh, that's an amazing idea. Yeah. So, so I'm going to be probably tired. So maybe Dan will speak up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. We're, yeah. we're not going to have like, um, it's not going to be a TA session where there'd be another lecture or problems or material. But if people want to show up and ask questions about any of our lectures or just ask us like what we ate for breakfast or you know really anything <laughs> we'll, we'll probably answer the questions so yeah 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 that's great that's that, that's really great actually um okay. yeah so i inter interrupt you boys so I, I didn't have much else to say um other than just the thanks end. again for the nice lecture the next lecture is in like nine minutes so you know see you all then great thank you
let's just give everyone a minute or two to come back. I'm sort of amazed that we're more or less on schedule by the end of the week, sure. you know? <laughs> Nice. There's been a nice convergence, a bunch of talks. Of, talked about Gaussian covariates the last couple of days. So it's like, <laughs> no, it's good. You know, one has to study the simple model before one can study the complicated model. Yeah, that's always true. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's let, let's slowly get started. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Um, very excited to have Andrea Montanari give the third lecture in the course. I think we're going to solve some problems using random matrix theory, maybe. <laughs> you know, uh, please take it away, Andrea, unless there's something else you'd like me to add or to announce. No, no, I'm fine. Um, yeah, so so let me just summarize uh, where we stand. Um, uh, we decided that in the linear regime, um, you know, the, the, the two layers and in fact, the multi-layer network can be approximated by ridge regression. In particular, we are interested in the ridgeless limit of this problem that is lambda to zero, but we decided that perhaps it's interesting to study the whole uh, ridge regression uh, trajectory. And, uh, and so this means that you know, what is inherited for, from the network is this design matrix phi. And uh, phi is a matrix with uh, IAD rows, and each row is obtained by drawing, you know, applying a, a figurization map phi, uh, lowercase phi, to uh, a covariate vectors that is d dimensional. Okay. And these maps are d to rp, where p in the case of two layer network is this. Uh, uh, you know, number of neurons times is the number of parameters. So it's the number of neurons times dimension plus one. Okay, so so as as uh, is usually the case, is uh, is useful always to first understand simpler models, right? And what is the simplest possible model I can think of for this mod that even if not necessarily you know matches our goal, is a Gaussian features model. It's just a model in which I place my featureization map by a matrix Z that has uh, IAD Gaussian rows. Okay, so the features, that is the rows of Z are, are Gaussian. So I'll assume that they are Gaussian with mean zero and quadrant sigma, where sigma is a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay, and um, and uh, okay, so these are, are the covariates and the response is, uh, is uh, you know, as the form, uh, I'll assume that is linear in the covariate. So it's beta star times zi plus noise and the noise is also independent Gaussian, okay? Now you, you, you will argue that this is very different from the model that I started with, but uh, you know, if nothing else for comparison, for the sake of comparison, this is a useful model to look at. Uh, and of course, I'd be interested in prediction error or in test error. And, and so I can write this just uh, to be explicit. Uh, in general, remember, I wrote the prediction error as a function of my, my function f and, uh, and uh, the distribution p. This is what my general notation for the test error. But, but in this case, the function f that I'm interested on is the results of ridge regression, so it depends on lambda. and the distribution P depends on sigma and of course on beta star and of course of the variance of the noise, but this is, doesn't matter. Uh, and this is just the expectation respect to a new test point of uh, beta hat lambda uh, Z nu minus beta star Z nu 
uh, square. Okay, notice this is a little bit different from what uh, I was used to do uh, when I introduced it in the in the uh, in the in the in the you know, previous lecture. This was an expectation of would be, you know, if to be completely consistent with the notation in the previous lectures, I will have to put here minus y star square. But since the noise is independent of z, the two differ only by a constant. So yeah, you forgive me. Um, and this can also be written as since z is Gaussian, you, know, you can easily take the expectation with the z nu, and this is equal to beta hat lambda minus beta star sigma norm square. Yes. Does this make sense? Does the model and the okay? Um, okay, this is to fit it all in the page. Okay, now uh, one very convenient thing that happens for ridge regression is that I can write explicitly the form of beta hat. Okay, so you solve this quadratic yeah, business here and you get a very simple formula from linear algebra that is beta hat of lambda is, um, so let's see how do I want to write it, it is one over n z transpose times S lambda of y, where S lambda is defined as the matrix one over n z z transpose plus lambda i minus one. Okay, and so if I substitute this uh, up here, um, by the way, this matrix, this kind of matrix, this is as you will see in the next lecture, this is the kernel matrix and, and will play an important role, I think, in the next lecture. Um, so, okay, if I substitute up there, what I get is that this, this business, this prediction error, now I have um, a square, so this is one over n, z transpose as lambda, and then here I have z beta star, plus w, this is what y is, uh, minus beta star sigma norm square. Now I can expand the square. You see now, now there are terms that depends on w and terms that doesn't, don't depend on w. So I, I group them as to whether they depend on w or not. So the one that don't depend on w are And the one that depend on W is, um, okay, let's write it as one over N. Okay, and then there is cross terms. Okay. Uh, so the first piece is basically uh, the bias of my estimator. You can recognize it. I mean, it's the square of the bias. It's the bias term. You recognize it because it, it's non-zero even if there is no noise. And, uh, and it's really due to the fact that I'm introducing this, this ridge regularization. So it's non-zero because I'm, I'm regularizing the model. The second is the variance term. Uh, you recognize it because it, it's proportional to the noise. And then there is the cross term that in expectation is zero. Because the it's expectation- missing a square, Andrea, maybe on the- oh, yeah. Right. yeah, there is a square, of course. And the cross term in expectation is zero, of course. Okay, so in particular, if I, if I look at the expectation, okay, if I define the expectation of, of this thing, This is beta star, I called it. This is really, you can write it. So this is, okay, I define the expectation, just the expectation respect only to W of our 
uh, lambda sigma beta star. You know, this, this, this R is, is a random object. This is a random variable, of course. It's random because Z is random and because of W is random. So let me, for simplicity, for a moment, look at the expectation with respect to W that, that simplifies a little bit. And this decomposes exactly in a bias term that I'm calling BN and the variance term that I call BN and the bias is, uh, uh, okay, let me just copy from me. If you, if, you, if you do the algebra, this takes the form of lambda times beta star times S lambda sigma S lambda beta star. This is just you know, doing a little uh, uh, you know, reordering of the matrices in, in here and the variance is, you know, if you, if you, so here there is nothing because this doesn't depend on W. So I need only to, to, you know, reorder the matrices that are in there. And the variance is, uh, well, you have to take the expectation. So when you take the expectation, you get, uh, okay, let's write it explicitly one over N square. And then the expectation of uh, what it is, is W and then S lambda S is, trans, is uh, symmetric and then Z transpose, and then Z S lambda W. And so if you do the expectation, you get the trace. And in the end of the day, you get sigma square over N, and then trace of S lambda square, if I'm correct, and then one over N Z sigma Z transpose. Okay. And so computing these quantities, computing the bias and the variance, it amounts to uh, you know, solving, solving, you know, computing the, the or you know, characterizing these amounts to characterizing this this trace and this uh, kind of uh, uh, matrix element. Okay, now uh, one thing to, to pay attention to is that the variance depends only on the eigenvalues. Okay, let, let me first state a result. Now I state a result that gives you, you know, a characterization of these quantities in a certain regime. So, so this is from a joint paper with uh, Hesti and then uh, Rosse and Tibshirani, and uh, let's say 2020 or, and, uh, and uh, so this, this is in which regime? The regime is that uh, uh, P over N is order one. And then uh, uh, the, if I call the eigenvalue of sigma lambda one, lambda P, so these are eigenvalues of sigma. Uh, the, the assumption is that lambda one is less than a constant and the sum over I one to P, one over P lambda I inverse is less than a constant. Okay, so here C is, is you know, a fixed constant and, and the constant in the statement follows from, depends on this C and the statement takes this form, uh, let Lambda star be unique, uh, unique solution of the following equation. Okay, so let me write the equation n one minus lambda over lambda star equal the trace of sigma sigma plus lambda star i inverse uh, and define these two quantity, let me call it V star perhaps of sigma. This is sigma square times the trace of sigma square, uh, sigma plus lambda star i minus two and then the denominator goes n minus trace of the same 
object. MB star. That depends on sigma and beta star. So these are definitions. Is uh, lambda star square times beta star times sigma plus lambda star i minus two and then there is sigma and then beta star i hope that i'm writing them uh, and then there is one minus n minus one and then the same object as before Okay, so okay, so these are two uh, expression that depends on sigma, on lambda star, and on on beta star. So on the parameters of the problem, uh, and and okay, uh, I'll, you know most of the lecture I'll try to unpack a little bit these these formulas that are you know look a little bit mysterious. Uh, then uh, there exists C zero positive such that. C0 so depends on the constant C at the beginning, such that with a probability, and okay, the paper will give some bound on the probability, the bias is really the bias. Yeah, so if I call this, this BN, I should call it really. This is BN of Z and lambda and beta. Then the bias at, so this depends also on beta star and lambda, minus the this asymptotic bias, or this, it's not really asymptotic, this, this predicted bias is something that goes to zero and the same for the variance. Now in the in the in the paper we don't prove about the cross term anything about the cross term but but you know that proof can also be written actually I was planning to write it in the in the in the lecture notes uh, in the latex lecture notes for this but okay I claim that also this is true um, I don't remember anymore how you call it okay R. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, so perhaps I had zoom out so that uh, now I can, can parse all of this theorem together. So this gives you a, a formula for the risk and, the, and the, you know, for the bias and the variance and for the risk. That is a formula in terms of sigma and beta star. And uh, one way to think, so first of all, it's uh, at least in this statement is a little bit different from what is the normal or the more standard for most standard form or most elementary form of statements in random matrix theory where you prove something about the limit. This is a non asymptotic statement n and p are two fixed numbers and then I gives you some approximation uh, for for those given n and p. Uh, now this might not be that interesting, but you know, I think in this case is useful to state these in things in this form because if you want to state things asymptotically, you have to, to assume that your sequence of matrices sigma, it's a subsequence that has some convergence property and the same for beta star, etc. You can make all of those asymptotic assumptions, 
uh, but I think it's more natural and, and nicer to state things for a given sigma and a given beta star. Um, yeah, so the, in the rest of the lecture, basically, I, I, I will try to unpack some you know, insights in this formula. Uh, so before perhaps I'll ask you, so there were a couple of questions, but now I don't see the names. Um, I had a quick question. So when you yeah. define lambda star um, in the left side, the numerator, is that, should that be lambda one or? Uh, so I defined lambda star in this way as the solution of this equation. Right, but the, the left-hand side, the numerator, the lambda, what is that? That is the regularization in the original uh, ridge regression problem, right? So uh, uh, I have ridge regression, right? I have this, oh, okay. this lambda. So this is the regularization parameter in the, in the original lambda. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, sorry. I thought, I thought lambda star was the optimal regularization. But that, that makes sense now. No. Lambda star is, so we'll comment a little bit on this lambda star in a minute. Okay, thank you. So every uh, lambda that you have for regularization, you get a, like a lambda star that pops out. All right. It's gonna be uh, what you're like, the, maybe not off. I guess I'm uh, trying to understand where B star, V star, like, they sort of depend on the regularization that you use. So I'm, it, it seems, uh, I'm, I'm trying to grasp what they would actually signify. Yeah, so, so beta star, so, so perhaps uh, I, I, I use too much of star, <laughs> stars here, but beta star refer to the true vector of parameters. Lambda star, perhaps I should call it lambda effective, is uh, is kind of an effective regularization parameters that you see in this in this uh, formula, right? And I'll, I'll comment in a minute on that. Perhaps I'll take the answer, the question by from Kartik. Uh, yeah, Professor. Um, I was just trying to understand like how C zero would would vary because this convergence here now is dependent on C zero. So C zero can be really really small, in which case convergence is slow. Oh. Right, right. So good question. Optimally, you would hope that C0 is one half, right? And now if I remember correctly, in the paper, uh, we prove for, for if lambda is bounded away from zero, so if the regularizer is bounded away from zero, uh, then we prove that C0 I think that we proved that C0 is 0 0.49, and that is it's one half minus epsilon, right? You cannot hope to get less than, than one half. One half yeah. is just the central limit theorem fluctuation. And I think that we prove uh, one half minus epsilon. Now for lambda equal zero, uh, you know, we don't prove such a strong result. And I, I really don't remember what is the C0 that we get is something like but one eighth or one sixteenth. But I, I guess lambda equal to zero is probably not such an interesting problem. But it is interesting. Yeah? It is interesting because it's actually the ridgeless case that is the one that we were were interested in. Okay, fair but, enough. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a good question, right? In you know this, you know the proof. If you look at the proof, we don't get the optimal you know, bounds on the error there. Right? It's an interesting question to improve those bounds. Thank you. Okay, if there is no more questions, so now let me let me comment uh, on this formula. So uh, perhaps the first remark is that what this formula gives is is an interesting equivalent. Is that we have an original? Oh, what's happening here? Sorry, but sometimes my. Okay, perhaps I have to change my pen. Apologies for this, but. So we have an original problem that has a design matrix Z. So this is what called the statistic, the design matrix. 
the uh, matrix of features that is a random matrix. And what this is kind of this is random matrix theory result uh, gives you some equivalent problem. Ah, uh, perhaps I should I should go into explaining this. Okay, first. Okay, sorry. Uh, apologies. Uh, I have to to write some formula before explaining this. Okay, so perhaps the, the simplest way to, to, to write this formula is first to look at, uh, so, okay. Sorry, I tried to invert order of things, but. So let, let me look for a moment at this equation, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, this object that appears down here, right? So this object is, uh, is trace of, sigma square times sigma plus lambda star i minus two. Right? This is of course less or equal than the trace of sigma times sigma plus lambda star i minus one, right? And in fact is, you know, if lambda star is positive, which also it always is, is strictly less. And this is less or equal than n uh, times one, it's actually equal to n times one minus lambda over lambda star. And so this is less or equal than n. Okay, so we deduced that this object is less than n. So let's assume for a moment, you know, for the sake of, it's not an important assumption, but let's, it, let's assume to simplify our uh, to interpret this formula, that this is that one over n trace of sigma square times sigma plus lambda star i minus two is less or equal than one minus a constant, okay? Where this is some finite constant. This is not the same C0, so let's call it C1. Okay, so let's assume that this happens. Then if you look at these denominators, for instance, this denominator here, this will be bigger or equal than one over C1. Okay, so if I, if I and the same, this, this object will be bigger or equal than N times uh, C, N over C1. Okay, so what I get is that under this assumption, just that simplifies my life, these formulas that I wrote are upper bounded by something you know, a bit simpler. That is C1 sigma square over N times the trace. The first one is the trace of uh, uh, whatever, sigma square times sigma plus lambda star I minus two. And the second one is less or equal than Again, C1 times lambda star square times uh, beta star times sigma, sigma plus lambda star i minus two theta star, uh, beta star. Okay, so now this formula, once I brought them in this form, is a bit, they have a very simple interpretation, right? If I look back, uh, you know, a few page above or one page above, and I look at, you know, the formulas for these two formula that I wrote here, this that I wrote below, they look very similar apart from that constant C1, right? So in fact, these are variants, these apart from the constant C1, these are uh, variants and bias in the following sequence model. I'll call it the sequence model. What is the sequence model? It's a model in which you observe, you have to estimate the same beta star 
But instead of observing Y, we observe this kind of object. We observe sigma one half times beta star plus noise and the noise is of order sigma over square root of n times epsilon, where epsilon is normal zero identity p. And then I, I, I estimate beta star, star by a ridge regression, beta at s is equal to arg mean of ys minus uh, sigma one half over b, b square plus lambda b square, lambda star b square. Okay. So the sequence model, it's a very simple model in which I uh, observe uh, beta star times sigma one half. So the, my design matrix is sigma one half. And then I, I do ridge regression with regularization parameter and lambda s. Why I call it the sequence model? Well, because you can rotate, you know, everything is rotation invariant, okay? So if I call uh, again, so equivalently, I can take a beta uh, lambda diagonal lambda one lambda p. Perhaps I should call differently the eigenvalue of sigma. Okay, let me call. And then you observe y s i equal lambda i one half times beta star i. This is of course, beta star in the basis in which sigma is diagonal plus sigma or square root of n epsilon i. So you have n uh, p decoupled problems and beta s i is, is just now the, the ridge problem de de decoupled. So is arg mean over b in r of y s i plus uh, minus lambda one half i bi square plus lambda star bi square. Okay, and this you can solve. And uh, I think the solution is, uh, the solution is what is lambda star uh, plus lambda i, lambda i one half, I think. If I remember correctly. All right. So it's a sequence model in the sense that is a model in which you observe a sequence of observations, a sequence of variables in, in Gaussian, independently in Gaussian noise, right? And what we are claiming here is that up to a constant, the variance, so this is, uh, this is just the claim is that this is C1 times the variance of the sequence model. And this is uh, uh, just uh, uh, C1 times the bias of the sequence model. That of course depends on sigma and uh, sigma, and this depends on sigma and beta star. In other words, this random matrix theory result, what it tells me is that uh, I have an equivalence between two you know, seemingly different models, right? Uh, an original, uh, ridge regression problems in which uh, you have Z, the matrix of covariance that is random. So this is the features matrix. And uh, the regularization is some lambda that is bigger or equal than zero. And then there is a sequence model uh, that has instead a deterministic design matrix that is sigma one half. And you have a different regularization. Okay. Now, interestingly, you know, now I'll, I'll, I will see in the minute, this regular new regularization is strictly larger than the original one. Okay, so passing from the original model to the sequence model, you know, 
pushes up the regularization value. Okay, so, so this is the, yeah. So can I ask a quick question, Andrea? Sure. So just to kind of make sure I understand, you know, in your original definition of the YIs, you could have, of course, written everything in terms of sigma to the one half beta star, you know, and just assumed that your ZIs were IID with mean zero and identity covariance. And so, so somehow the difference between these models is that in one case, you get to dot with a random vector. And in the sequence model, you're allowed, you get the dot with just the unit coordinate vectors that you know beforehand. Uh, is, yeah. Is that, that's fair, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that you have to pay attention is that, of course, if you, if you redefine beta or B by, you know, as sigma one half times B, then the regularization here, the ridge regularization becomes a weighted L2 norm, right? Ah, uh, right. Right, so, and like, uh, I see. So sigma is not is not irrelevant. It's always important, right? So you can, you know, in other words, two models with different sigmas will have a different uh, risk curves. Got it. Got it. And so that's one of the things that contributes to the new lambda star. You have to use right. to compute it, and then you know also maybe the fact that your vectors are are not random anymore. You're dotting with. Yeah, so everything, you know, depends, uh, you know, in the end, you know, you can eliminate some of the complexity, but, you know, this formula will depend in a non-trivial way on two things, right? One is the sequence of eigenvalues of sigmas, and then it, the other is the, is, is beta star, namely how beta star looks in the basis of, of the eigenvalues of sigma, right? Of the eigenvectors of sigma. Uh, so the geometry of the two matters. So if I if I want this to write this a little bit uh, more explicitly, uh, you could equivalently, you know, perhaps I should have used written this a bit more explicitly. The sequence model. So if this is the eigenvalue decomposition. of sigma of the covariance, then the you know, effective sequence model is given by this, right? But yeah, at the, level, at the level of the original ridge, yeah, I mean, you cannot get rid of the sigmas because of course you can write the ridge problem as y minus, let me call it g, where g is a matrix with IID entries, sigma one half b, square, as you said, but there is always the regularizer, right? And this matters also when you let lambda to zero. Of course, it doesn't matter in the underparameterized regime, but in the overparameterized regime, it matters. So this, you can redefine, uh, you can redefine things and, you know, what Boris is saying, so this is, there is a square, sorry. You can redefine things and write this as y minus g b tilde, square plus lambda, but now here you have sigma minus one half B tilde. All right, so, so let's look for a moment at this uh, effective uh, regularization. And, uh, and uh, okay, so the equation that is satisfied by this effective regularization is uh, uh, N, uh, no, so let's write it perhaps like this. One minus uh, lambda over lambda star equal one over n, and then there is the trace of sigma times sigma plus lambda star i minus one. So this is uh, an interesting equation. So let's, let me just drive it, draw it graphically. This is as a function of, yeah, okay, as a function of, let's call it x, the argument. And so you have two functions. One is the left hand side. It looks like this. So here is one, perhaps. And then there is this curve. Oh. This is the curve one minus lambda over x. 
and hits zero at lambda. Okay, and the other is the 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 if I call it f sigma of lambda star, uh, this behaves like this at zero. It's p over n, right? Because at at uh, you know zero is the trace of the identity, so it's p, so it's p over n. So in the other parameterized regime, uh, at zero is bigger. That is what we are interested in. Is bigger than one, okay? And then it monotonically decreasing and goes to zero at infinity, right? And then uh, okay, so of course there is a unique solution as you see from from this basic property, and this solution is is lambda star. And so we observe two things. We observe that lambda star is always uh, bigger than lambda. And uh, even if lambda equal to zero, if lambda equal to zero, then le the left-hand side is one, but even in this case, lambda star is positive. And this has an interesting statistical interpretation, of course, that you start with an uh, unregularized problem. That is uh, with the, it's not really nor unregularized because underlying this, we are always doing the mean norm regularization because we are computing pseudo intervals. But, and we end up with a prob problem with positive regularization. So this sometimes we call self-induced regularization. In other words, the fact that there is noise in the covariates, then the covariates are random, produces some regularization effect that was not there to start with. Um, okay, so the last thing that I wanted to do in the, in the uh, perhaps I can ask if there is any question about this. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I so I um, I couldn't follow the part where you said lambda equal to zero, the unregularized case. You're saying we we can still we still get lambda star as greater than zero. Right. I'm trying to figure In, out how the equations. I mean, the, both the left hand side and the right hand side were uh, matching. Well, in the, in the unregularized case, in the lambda equal to zero, the left-hand side is one. Correct. Okay. And so they, the two, the two things intersect here. As you see. So this is, you know, this point is, you know, if you want, this is lambda star at lambda equal zero. As you see, I mean, okay, now I, I, you know, I didn't do the calculus of showing you that is strictly positive, but you can check since you know, the, the left hand side is, is a continuous function of x, f sigma, f sigma x is a continuous function of x with f sigma, f sigma of zero equal p over n strictly bigger than one. Okay? Yes. Okay. I think Isha had a question. Uh, yes, uh, Professor, uh, as you mentioned, the lambda star only has a positive solution, uh, has a positive solution only when P over N is smaller than one, right? Am I understanding correctly? P over N bigger than one. P over N, but bigger than one, then, then the left hand side has to be bigger than one. Then lambda star have to be negative. No, 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 wait a minute. So, so I'm finding, I'm trying to find a solution of this equation. This is equation in a variable lambda star. Yes. So it's some function of lambda star equals some other function of lambda star. These are these two function. In fact, for any, these are this green function and the red function. 
So the green function is, uh, is, uh, is always de strictly decreasing. Right. The green function is always strictly increasing and the red function is strictly decreasing. And the red function starts at P over N and goes to zero. So they always have one intersection. So in fact, for lambda positive, doesn't matter what is P over N, there is always a unique positive solution. So the right-hand side of this formula is the order of P over N. Am I understanding it correctly? No, no, I don't think. The, the right-hand uh, right side is a function F sigma of lambda star. This right. is the right-hand side. Okay, it it's a function of lambda right. star. Lambda star, now if I plot this function as a function of X, it is P over N at zero, and then decreases to zero at infinity. All right, okay. Okay. So F of X, F sigma of X goes to zero. Oh, let's write it like this. Limit X, this is zero. F sigma of zero is P over N. And F sigma, let's say F sigma prime, in fact, is differentiable of X is negative. All right. So, right. Okay, great. Good that everybody. Okay, so this is a very uh, nice equation. So let uh, in the last 10 minutes or you know, the next 10 minutes, I want to basically discuss two simple examples. So uh, example number one, let's, let's take the simplest possible example is take sigma equal identity. So independent covariates, okay? So this is, this is very simple. If you look at the left-hand side of this equation, the equation looks like one minus lambda over lambda star equal what? Equal P over N. Uh, and, and, okay, equal P over N times uh, one over one plus lambda star. Now this in general is a second order equation, but let's, let's take uh, uh, further simplification of taking lambda to zero. If lambda goes to zero, you get one equal P over N, one over lambda, one plus lambda star. And this you can solve it, let's call P over N gamma. This is the over parameterization ratio. And you get what? You get uh, whatever, gamma star, <laughs> lambda star, equal gamma minus one plus. Okay, so you have some effective regularization that as soon as you over parameterize is strictly positive. And then, you know, with this, you can compute the formula for the variance and the, and the bias and the, the variance of is a function just of gamma in this case. So with abuse of notation is for gamma less than one and one over gamma minus one for gamma bigger than one. And the bias is, of course, in this case, the bias only depends on the norm of the signal. Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, so the, the variance looks like this. So there is a, here is gamma. This is gamma equal one. The variance looks like this, looks like this. And the, the bias looks like, the bias is zero up to one. And then, as it should be, right? If I'm under parameterized and I don't regularize, I don't have bias. If I regularize, 
if I do a minimal, even a minimal regularization and I'm over parameterized, I have some bias. So if I add the two, so this, this red one is the bias. And if I add the two, uh, in general, the curves looks like this. Uh, the risk looks like this and then like this. Okay, so this is uh, interesting because as some features of, uh, of uh, this double descent uh, phenomenon that, that uh, perhaps Misha has talked to you about, that is you move in the over and you observe for neural network, you over parameterize. And so, you know, this is, as you increase the number of parameters, first you observe that you are overfitting. And so when you approach the over parameterization threshold, the risk diverges. And in this case is purely due to, to variance. But then when you move beyond that, the risk decreases again. And in this case, reaches a, 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 a local minimum as some gamma positive, gamma is little larger than one, and then saturates and goes to the, to the null risk. Okay, so this is the, the overall risk. Now this again, share some features of, of the double descent phenomenon that you observe in neural network, but uh, uh, in many respects is not that, uh, in some respect is not that close. First of all, the global minimum is reached at gamma equal zero. So you would not have any reason by looking at this model to overparameterize, to move in the overparameterized regime. And second and more, more fundamentally here increasing uh, gamma has two simultaneous effects, right? You increase the complexity of your model, but you increase also the, comp you know, the number of parameters that you are fitting, but you increase also the number of parameters that describe the truth. So you also increase the complexity of you know, the true distribution, okay? So somehow you are changing two things at the same time. Instead, you know, to understand neural network, we want to understand the setting in which the true function keep its complexity. And instead uh, we increase the number of parameters that we use to parameterize our model, the model that we learn, okay? So this model, this first example is a nice simple example to, for, for our you know, random matrix theory calculation, but it's not really that, that useful to understand neural networks. Can I ask you a quick question actually about yeah. it, Red, just in connection potentially with what you're about to say, but I'm not sure. So, you know, there, there's also this like um, thing by Peter Bartlett and some collaborators like the benign overfitting paper, you know, there's a lot of things that are around this. And, mm -hmm. and is the point that, that the sigma being the identity, the fact that the eigenvalues don't decay in a kind of appropriate way, what causes the kind of the global maximum, at least on the right-hand side of the interpolation threshold, not to go off to infinity or the global minimum of your risk, I guess. Yeah, so, so that, is, that is the fact that, uh, yeah, there is no structure in, in the eigenvalues and there is uh, no, also no kind of correlation between the, uh, you know, the eigenvalues of the eigenvectors. It's not just a, a question of eigenvalues because you can trace the same curve if you have, uh, you know, if you take the case of, uh, you know, you know, okay, you can, you can do the example 1b in which, uh, uh, let's say one prime, this would be that you take a uh, general sigma, okay, it's not really general, but general in the sense that satisfies the, the condition of the theorem. Uh, and then uh, you take a beta star that is random. Mm? And by random, I mean, for instance, uniform on the sphere of some radius R or, or Gaussian is the same, normal zero, uh, P minus one, sorry, uh, R square over P, IP. 
Okay, so if you take this choice, so basically beta is uncorrelated with this, you can write similar formula and trace these curves and, and you obtain the same qualitative behavior. You don't, you, you don't obtain a global minimum at large over parameterization, okay? Now, okay, so in this lecture, I'm avoiding giving references because as I, as I mentioned, you know, it takes quite some time, but, but, uh, but uh, yeah, of course there is the work of Peter and uh, you know, Bartlett Ziegler, Long Lugosi and then Bartlett Ziegler that you know, analyzes the same problem from you know, different methods with different methods. And uh, if you look at the review paper, we, we, we did an effort to kind of compare the two, right? And so one thing is that the two regimes are a bit incomparable in the sense that this focuses, you know, random matrix theory focuses on the proportional regime while they get something that is not in the proportional regime. In the proportional regime, but if you look at the proportional regime and you look at the formula that I brought, you can, derive from the formula that I brought, brought the bounds of, of Bartlett, or I don't remember okay. whether they are exactly the same. I think they are basically the same bounds and, and as in Bartlett uh, et al. papers, right? So at least in the proportional regime, we understand very well things, how things are connected and those formulas, uh, those bounds form, follow from the formula that I gave you, okay? No, yes. of course, if you neglect the error term n to the minus c zero, so, sure. okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to, you know, perhaps in last, you know, give one other example that is more interesting, I think. Actually, it's, it's I think it's, it's the, uh, gives the right intuition, and that uh, I'll call it latent space model. And, uh, and here, what I assume, I assume that there exists uh, an underlying uh, uh, covariates vector, uh, xi, that is d-dimensional. Okay, and then the responses are just a linear function of the xi's. So think as d as less than p, the number of parameters plus noise. And then, okay, I should have commented that I'm assuming, I'm making all of this Gaussian assumption, but in the paper we prove it for, you know, some non-Gaussian model. Okay, and but now, so this is the true, the true model, but now I perform regression with respect to uh, a feature vector zi that is wxi plus noise. And this is p-dimensional. Okay, so here say that ui and uh, <laughs> W is a matrix that is P by D. Okay, and um, okay, if you if you look at the paper with Hesty uh, and others, uh, okay, we, we do the calculation, we can apply our, you know, we do the calculation for a matrix that is proportional to an orthogonal matrix, basically. Okay, and, and for hidden covariance that are also normal. Okay, so what is the 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 you know the mapping between this and the original model? Of course, if this x is Gaussian, now the zi are Gaussians, right? Zi, so mapping to previous model. Uh, well, if the, 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 the xi are Gaussian, now the zi are uh, normal with mean zero and covariance that is to square identity plus w, uh, w transpose. Okay, and so this is my matrix sigma. In other words, I have a matrix sigma that has uh, 
uh, the eigenvalues that are equal, and they are uh, they are what they are p mu over d plus two square, and uh, the other one are equal to just two square. Right. And we can make this. Uh, and of course, yeah, since everything is jointly Gaussian, we can write also the yi as some vector beta star times the i plus noise for some beta star that I will not write. And an important thing is that beta star is aligned with, the, you know, as a non trivial projection of, on W. So it's somewhat aligned uh, to W. Okay, so so via this mapping, I can apply my general formula. And now, if you if you again look at the uh, so this is in this HMRT paper. If you look at the curve there, now they look like really the nice double descent curves in the sense that as a function of the overparameterization, if I plot the risk, it looks like this. It has a divergence when. Here I fix n over d fixed, and I plot the risk curve either in simulation or predicted by the theory as a function of the overparameterization. Okay, so this is a model in which the complexity of the underlying distribution remain unchanged by I'm just adding more and more variables to my model, and this is monotone decreasing. And the global minimum is obtained at very large uh, overparametrization. So this is very nice because I mean, this model not only reproduces this, this phenomena, but starts to look similar to what we are interested in. And in fact, one can make this very precise, but let me leave it at the level of interpretation. The interpretation of one interpretation of this model is that uh, while we are looking at the random feature model in which we have a featureization map that is uh, a simple featureization map, a very simple featureization map, is a linear featureization map and is a linear noisy featureization map. In other words, you can interpret this as a two layer neural networks. with random, with the noisy linear neurons. Each component of this is computing W times X, WI times X plus UI. So it's a neuron that is doing something a bit silly. Instead of computing uh, you know, ReLU, is computing a linear function and adding noise, okay? Despite what it's doing is silly, the phenomenology of, of the risk curve is, is what we uh, wanted to reproduce. So this should be compared, of course, to uh, a neural network in which, uh, at least in the, in the in random feature, if, if you have a random first layer, you have a featureization map that is this one. And if you have, uh, if you have the neural tangent, what I described in the two layer case, we have this kind of thing. Right, so these models have of course a more complex featureization map, but uh, the behavior is, is very similar. And in fact, you know, one can prove that uh, at least in, this, in some cases it, is, it has been proved that asymptotically the, the risk curve of the two type of models. So random linear featureization maps and you know, linearized neural networks are actually asymptotically the same. So it's not just an interpretation, but it's really uh, something more than that. 
but for the moment, a limited in interpretation. Okay, I guess that's all for, for what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I'll take question. There is a question from Sidak. Um, hi. So hi. Uh, I'm just wondering, for example, if you were to run this two-layer network that you have sketched over here, not with the uh, regression solver, not the pseudo inverse, but with gradient descent. So you cannot just initialize all the weights to zero. Would you still see the same curve? Uh, which neural network? Neural with the random linear units? Yeah, random, uh, like this two layer network with this noisy linear neurons or something like that. But and what I do, I learned the Ws. So, I mean, here the, the premise is that I mean, this condense is a random, so it's a something extremely stupid, right? I'm a random linear network in which the first layer is not learned, right? Mm -hmm. I only learn the second layer, and the first layer is made of random linear units. Okay, so this is the interpretation of this latent feature model, in other words, right? Uh, so now I right. don't understand exactly what you want to do with the gradient descent, because if I learn all, only the second layer weights, well, there is right. a unique, I mean, not a unique, but uh, yeah, yeah. it's a convex function. The quadratic convex function. Yeah. And, um, yeah. In the, I think in, when uh, just the last layer is trained, it does not cause that issue. But if all the, if let's say if, if, if you have a two layer network still, but both the layers are trained, now there's going to be a difference, right? The gradient descent will not end up. Right. I agree completely. If you start with the first layer weights equal to zero, then you will, you will behave quite differently. And is there some analysis which tries to do it for not from zero initialization, just for a typical neural network one layer, two layer, let's say? Uh, two layer networks <laughs> from a typical initialization, right. but in the linear regime or not in the linear regime? I mean, in, this in, is, the, um, in the linear regime, this is, you know, analyzing the risk, this is what we, I mean, I'll, you know, I'm kind of building my way to getting there. Uh, but uh, now, you know, as I, as I mentioned in the previous lectures, it's not obvious that the linear regime is the correct one. But well, the linear regime, well, uh, the linear regime again allows you to use kernel, and then I think you'll again uh, do the kernel inversion, right? Not solved by gradient descent, right? But I mean, it is solved by gradient descent in the sense okay, that yeah, in that case, yeah. the minimum norm. Yeah. Okay, perhaps I'll ask. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, perhaps <laughs> if you have more. Let's, Gadi had a question. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so I was wondering if th this kind of the two pictures uh, that you showed of the, of the curve is something I'm very interested in. So is it, it seems so. It, it distinguishes two cases where there's kind of an optimal overparameterization, or that it's always better to keep increasing. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, so it's, for me, it's an interesting question for like real world settings. And I wonder if any, like the, the two examples you showed were very kind of simple minded. And I'm wondering if any, if there's some kind of ingredient in them, that kind of can be somehow ex extended to more real world settings, or is it just, you know, two just illustrative examples? Uh, okay, so, so there is, um, uh, yeah, I don't know what, what do you mean by real world exam, uh, settings, so but I, uh, I mean, I'm, I mean, okay, so, so just, uh, completely different settings, but for instance, for again, so it's like the empirical evidence that I know of is that, for, for instance, um, for uh, image classification, uh, if you have fully connected uh, architectures with possibly many layers and, and nonlinearities, then it seems that uh, um, it's better to keep increasing the width. So, so like uh, kernel net, like the corresponding like NNGP or NTK behaves, mm -hmm. has better generalization than any finite network. But if you do kind of the same for 
subclass of, of CNNs, then there appears to be some kind of optimal width, optimal number of channels there. So it, it kind of somehow maps to these two pictures. And I'm wondering if anything could be taken kind of uh, from this, from these toy models to that scenario, or is it completely unrelated? Um, or is it hard to say, I guess, maybe? Well, okay, so perhaps something that, uh, okay, so, so there are two types of things that I can say about it. One is that, you know, you know as I wrote this, you know, theory gives a formula for any metric sigma pair sigma beta star, right? And then, you know, depending on how you choose sigma and beta star, you can figure out where is the optimal. I mean, you can obtain all sorts of behavior that the optimal over parameterization is finite or infinite, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, yeah, okay, so, so that is one thing. It will depend on sigma and beta star. And uh, we, do we have a, an analytic uh, you know, understanding of that? No, I think we have mostly examples, but yeah. the intuition is that when beta star is, sigma is a low dimensional component and beta star is aligned with it, then now perhaps a more real, slightly more realistic thing is to look at, um, a random feature models. Uh, so this is something that perhaps I mentioned in the last lecture, but uh, you know, you look really at two layer neural network, talking always about theory uh, and uh, mm -hmm. you do this and then these are random. Mm -hmm. I'm always fitting only this thing, right? And now in this case, you can again derive the, the risk curve asymptotically. And in this case, uh, Okay, there are two things to notice. Uh, first, that um, uh, the optimal, we always observe that the optimal risk is obtained in an infinite over parameterization. And uh, the second thing that you observe, I mean, the second thing that you observe also in this model and I no, don't talk about is that actually, you know, lambda positive helps. So it's not always optimal to interpolate. So if I traced this curve that diverges and I said, okay, so you should go at infinite over parameterization and you know, interpolating is good. But if you plot the, the curve that you have obtained with the optimal regularization, it's a much nicer curve. It's monotone decreasing, it's completely smooth and achieves the optimal, okay? Uh, now, it turns out to be the case that in some cases, these two coincide at infinity. So the picture is like this at high SNR. So this is a red curve is optimal lambda. And the blue curve is lambda equal zero. And there are some cases, so at low SNR instead, so this is a difference you know, that I think it's, this is an insight that I think it's useful for application is that at low SNR, uh, there is a gap. Okay, perhaps I didn't draw it very well. This saturates to saturate to do the thing differently. So this says that at, at low SNR, you know, this phenomenon that interpolation is good is something that is true above a certain critical threshold. It's surprising that this regime exists, but it says that is not what you should always do. And also this, I think this is consistent with what we see empirically, this overparameterized model extremely overparameterized model, interpolating model are good for you know, image classification tasks that are very low, uh, very high SNR tasks typically, but they are not good in doing, uh, I mean, uh, they don't seem as good in being doing, I don't know, genomics, right? That are very low SNR models, right? right. Thanks. Alexei, other questions? Um, thank you. 
Uh, so I have somewhat uh, a broad question. Um, so here you studied um, Gaussian random matrices, but um, probably it's technically hard, but you can also study the ones with, you know, uh, quartic and so on. And with? maybe the, um, so instead of Gaussian distributions, you can study the ones with the quartic terms and so on, non-Gaussian ones. And presumably the answer will be different, but like all random matrices, they, they uh, share the same property that their eigenvalues repel. So you always have this Wigner surmise regarding of the overall shape of the eigenvalue distribution. And I'm wondering if it is important for your analysis and similar analysis that this theoretical approach, it seems to have this implicit bias that you assume that these random features essentially in some sense chaotic that their, their eigenvalues repel. Um, okay, so there are a few things there, right? So just to clarify, so the matrix here has independent rows, right? Uh, so this corresponds, uh, so, so the more general model under which we prove this theorem is, is the following. These are is in independent rows and then the zi each row is sigma one half times, I don't know how to call it, uh, something that I didn't use so far. Let's call, okay, let me call it uh, zeta i, where zeta i is i at the entry. Non Gaussian, not necessarily Gaussian entries. And there is some moment condition that now I don't remember, e of zeta i j to the c is fine, it's something like that. I don't remember what is c. Right, uh, now, why this model? Well, because independent rows, this means that the samples that I observe are independent. This is kind of a standard assumption in, in machine learning and statistics. I go out on the world, I co collect data, each data point that I observe is independent, okay? Or people you know, upload their pictures on YouTube that they, they are in, you know, what I upload is independent from what you upload, right? So this is, but the you know, entries of each row are dependent because the pixel, two pixels of an image are, are not independent. So you want sigma to be not identity. Now, this is, this is the model. Now, I think that what you are thinking about when you say quartic term is orthogonal invariant models, right? So these are, you know, typically, you know, the measure is X. I think that what you have in mind is something like this, perhaps. Or something like this, where V is a polynomial. And, uh, and now this gives you dependence between the rows and the columns. Uh, uh, but it doesn't give necessarily a nice way to obtain a general sigma. Here we are very interested in understanding the dependence on sigma. It's not obvious that this gives you a, a simple way of, of getting uh, no, a general sigma. Uh, now you could study if perhaps you know, something like this And then perhaps you want Z. Now this gives you perhaps something to get a general covariance between the columns. But uh, so this was one part of the question. The other part of the question is, I think, what is the feature of sigma that matter? And yeah, of course, the spectrum of sigma, the, the feature of the random matrix that matter. Of course, the spectrum matter, right? For instance, if I if I write what is the the covariance of this the 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 variance term, the explicit formula for the variance term was let me go back and, and copy it was something like s lambda. Okay, let's write what is s lambda. Was like something like one over n uh, z z transpose plus lambda i inverse 
and then there is one over n z sigma z transpose now this doesn't depend uniquely on the eigenvalues so normally in matrix random matrix theory one focuses on the eigenvalues of z z transpose but this this object doesn't depend just on the eigenvalue if this on the eigenvalues if this matrix wasn't there then this would be just a function of the eigenvalues but now this matrix is there so what you get is something that depends both on the eigenvalues and on the eigenvectors. Okay, so there is one more question from Varun. Um, so I, I had a question about, so, so far, all of the analysis that we're doing, it, the output is one number on the real line, right? So if, if we wanted to like expand that to have like a, like a vector output, for let's say classification or whatever. Um, is this, uh, I'm first of all wondering if that's like easily, <clears throat> does all of the work that we did easily sort of translate? Uh, and number two, the I've, this, the, I think you called this entire regime like lazy training. You <laughs> held the first part of the network, i.e. Like, like you have random features mm -hmm. and then you just trained the last layer uh, and I was wondering if there's any work that you know of, or if you've like thought about this, where if you do have a vector output and you stay at that dimension, then what you might do is like have a two layer, like initially have a Gaussian initial uh, um, random features in the first layer, train the second layer if it has vector outputs. And then if I wanted to add now I could like hold this part of like this like neural net constant at another layer of the same dimension and repeat that and sort of lazy train in sequence. And if that's like something that's been happened or like, like sort of observed or studied. Uh, okay, first of all, any answer regarding has this been done? or not is not answerable by a single human, <laughs> given the yeah. you know, size of the literature on these topics. Um, sure. Second, uh, okay, so one, one remark is that, okay, in this lazy tra training, at least what we are getting at is, is not something just learning the second layer, it's also learning the first layer, but learning it in the, in the you know, two linear order, right? So because we have the featureization map that we have in mind is, uh, is especially this one, right? Mm -hmm. This is what we really, really would like to understand, and uh, and this is uh, uh, corresponds not to lay learning the second layer, but learning the first layer in the lazy in the linearized regime. So that is one remark. Now. Then you had the one question about, can we do this to uh, more than one output, right? Um, I think so, right? And I think it can be done in the sense that if now I have my network that is, uh, yeah, the second layers are, uh, are vectors. So the AI are perhaps vectors in, in some RK, I think that this can be done. Uh, I don't know, and you know, if it is square loss, so now I call this F, and now I minimize. I have a response that is a vector I think this in the linear regime can be uh, analyzed. My guess is that a theoristic level, so the, your question is, is this an easy generalization? My guess is that a theoristic level is an is a easy generalization or modulo some, a certain amount of calculations that uh, random metrics is probably you know, at, the, at the rigorous level, my experience is that everything that is easy, easy, then when you try to prove there are all sorts of troubles that pop up. <laughs> so 
So <laughs> I think it's probably doable, but uh, you know, we'll take you know, one year or something like that. Um, and then uh, now, if you go beyond this, uh, the point is that now, if you go, uh, can you do this thing in which you learn one layer at a time? Good question. Um, I think that you could do for one layer. <laughs> if you have a multi-layer network, I could uh, perhaps learn one layer. I mean, you can learn all jointly in the linear regime. So in the linear regime, it doesn't matter that you what you want to, to do jointly or non-jointly. But, but then the random matrix theory, then it becomes really difficult uh, in the sense that um, you know, I'm not sure how to... How to extend things that we have done in that case. Um, the, the reason I brought it up is like in Sho's lecture, you have like this initial distribution that gets pushed forward at every time, but they're doing it all at once with like all of training and um, like applying gradient descent throughout. And I was wondering if like, oh, you push the, you push forward the distribution one layer, train, push it forward. And if that would like, it seems like it's a little bit less optimal. That's that's kind of like now. I mean, the point is that if you train one layer, so say that you train the second layer. I mean, if it is in the linear regime, okay, okay, everything can be done, right? Everything can be done. Not everything really, but uh, at least in theory, you can do it. It's a complicated random matrix theory problem. That's what it is, right? Now. If you are beyond the linear regime, now I train the second layer. So I train this layer. Uh, and now I go and look at this layer. Um, and I try to analyze this layer. So that so let's say that I train this layer in the out of the linear regime. And I and then I train this layer in the linear regime. Now things become really complicated because I don't have uh, any ID structure around, around data because the response function that I observe here depends on the weights of this layer. And so it becomes correlated. So I don't have any ID structure across data, I think. And I don't have any ID structure across uh, nodes. So, you know, okay. <laughs> no, no, that makes sense. It's now, Something that is different is that uh, you know, I could try to study things in the linear regime for losses that are not square loss. And so this could correspond to, for instance, I have a small number of K nodes. Okay. And then uh, here you have perhaps a two layer network. So this part is in the linear regime and this is fixed. Or, or yeah, it's fixed or, you know, it's equivalent if you take it instead of fixed, you take it that you train it as long as this, this last number of nodes is of order one. Then that I think can be done uh, uh, rigorously. Um, but, you know, even, yeah. No, I mentioned here that we did this, this model in which you train only the, also the AI. Uh, I think that even doing this for for non-square losses, general non-square losses is is quite you know for some non-square losses can be done like strongly convex, but for general non-square losses, it's not easy than that. Gotcha. Thanks. Rigorously. Okay, I think maybe we've exhausted Andrea with questions, or maybe he's exhausted us with answers. No, uh, <laughs> I exhausted my knowledge. <laughs> no. Uh, no, but th so thank you again for the lecture. Like the like the previous two it was very nice. I think extremely informative. In fact, it's it's really hard to get one's head around exactly what is proved where and you know what the takeaway is. So it's very useful. I think. Um, okay. Yeah. So so I, guess I will. I'll, yeah. Um, I'll see. You week or yeah indeed exactly see you next week see everybody in fact next week although i do remind the students that there are ta sessions this afternoon which you should definitely attend to ask more questions okay. um, and uh yeah otherwise i hope everyone has a good weekend okay you too
Bye.